Relatively early in Doctor Who's history, Terry Nation decided that the Daleks were a worthy enough adversary to make them the only other race in the galaxy who were capable of time travel. Their time machine was introduced in The Chase, but giving the Daleks time travel capabilities made them almost too powerful. So when Terry Nation came to plan his next serial, The Daleks Master Plan, there would be no more hopping through history. The adventure would be grounded in a single realistic setting, inspired by a sensational new cinematic franchise. But as you may know, the final screen version does feature the Dalek time machine after all, which launches Master Plan into yet another pursuit through time. So what then was the desperate situation in the development of the script that completely changed Terry Nation's vision for the story? When this second version of the time vessel was constructed, there were some extremely intriguing details in the props and scenery inside. But what was the disaster that happened in storage that forced the production team into the kind of gigantic continuity error which we love to examine? detailed investigations into TV productions, then we'd be very grateful for your subscription as we are working hard to build our channel. If you're looking for some way to further express your gratitude, we would love your support on Patreon, where you can see clips and early videos and get your name in the end credits. Alternatively, you can now become a channel member on YouTube using the join button below to get the same perks as Patreon. We work really hard to bring you the best content we can, and we sincerely appreciate everyone's support, even as simple as clicking the like button. During 1964, the third film in the James Bond franchise, Goldfinger, had enjoyed enormous success, and it was still being shown in UK theatres in January of 1965. As Terry Nation bashed out his third Dalek serial, he was no doubt musing on how Sean Connery's secret agent character had recently transformed from a moderate cinematic success into a cultural phenomenon. And then, while still working on the chase, Nation was approached to write a fourth Dalek serial. It would be another six-parter, however, he was also offered an extra single episode without the regular cast, which could function as a prologue. The lack of regular cast provided a perfect opportunity for him to develop an idea that he had been percolating, James Bond in space. Almost concurrently with him finishing the scripts for The Chase, he was formally commissioned to write his fourth Dalek serials prologue episode on the 25th of February 1965, and his idea for the Space Security Service was born. Over the next couple of months, he formulated ideas for his six-part spy story with the Daleks, and figured out how his prologue episode would set up the later events. After delivering his script for the prologue, entitled Mission to the Unknown, he was then formally commissioned to write the six-part James Bond in Space Dalek story on the 24th of May. It would be called The Dalek's Master Plan. Unlike the previous Dalek story, which had been a whimsical pursuit through time filled with comedic moments and larger-than-life characters, The Dalek's Master Plan would be a punchy thriller grounded in a gritty future. This time, the pursuit element was in the spy genre, as our heroes speed around in different stolen vehicles, including a luxury space yacht, and have fortuitous escapes thanks to unusual gadgets. We see a grim prison, a swanky government facility, an exotic land, and, true to all good Bond movies, it concludes with infiltration of the villain's underground lair. The serial, set all in one time period, was populated by a consistent set of antagonists, corrupt foreign politicians, and their MI6-style space security service, along with the Daleks, of course. Nation had very much set out his stall in Mission to the Unknown, which even included the line, License to kill. And in Nation's original draft, Sarah Kingdom is given the designation Agent 550 to Mirror 007. Funnily enough, production assistant Victor's Ritellis thought it made no sense to give her a secret codename to protect her identity and also reveal her name. He seems to have missed a memo about a certain 007 giving out his name to everyone he meets. Here is a synopsis of the original six-part version, which was initially all set in the year 1 million, 
although this was changed by the production team to the more relatable year 4000. In Nation's original idea, the main character was called Brett Walton, who he referred to as the 007 of space. We meet him on the planet Varga, where the Doctor steals and hides a vital part of the Dalek's magnificent new device. We are introduced to the benign ruler of the solar system called Ban Hung, who is revealed to be a traitor at the end of episode 1. His posh space yacht is stolen by the Doctor's party, who crash it on a penal colony with both the security service and the Daleks hot on their heels. Our heroes escape from the penal planet and flee to New Washington, where, at a government facility, Brett's friend Tom manages to bundle them into a rocket and shoot them off to the planet of mists. In close pursuit, the Daleks arrive there too, have a brush with the invisible inhabitants before tricking the Doctor and company into stealing their pursuit ship. The Dalek ship is in fact on a set course to return to Varga, where occurs, in Nation's own words, the final punch-up with the Daleks, whose weapon is ultimately used against them. This storyline, in its six-part form, was commissioned on the 24th of May 1965, but not long after, the Doctor Who production team was handed a problem. They were advised by the powers that be that their double O escapade should be double length, a cumbersome 12 episodes. This was a big problem, because Nation was already somewhat begrudgingly writing for the Daleks a fourth time, and in fact his six master plan episodes would be his final contribution to Doctor Who for seven years. He was in demand elsewhere, writing a series called The Baron, and the only way that the Dalek serial could be made twice as long was to assign another writer to produce the added episodes. Verity Lambert's choice for the task was Dennis Spooner, and he was drafted in on the 28th of May. Spooner had cut his teeth with the Daleks whilst working as story editor on The Chase, for which his duties required him to make changes to the drafts submitted by Nation. Now he would be tasked with writing a full six episodes of his own, and these would form the latter half of the inflated Daleks master plan. But before he was formally commissioned, the important question to answer was, what would he actually be writing? In June of 1965, a team of five convened for informal and well-lubricated meetings to answer this question and figure out what material Dennis Spooner could use to fill up his pages. Nation's James Bond in space formed a strong six-episode outline, and the MacGuffin of the stolen Dalek device could ultimately be resolved in the same way, with the so-called final punch-up with the Daleks pushed back to the end of episode 12. But what could entertain audiences for an additional six episodes in the meantime? The men in the meeting were writers Nation and Spooner, director Douglas Camfield, story editor Donald Tosh, and producer John Wiles. They put their heads together and decided to simply exploit the fact that the Daleks' master plan was already an elongated chase, just like the, uh, chase. Therefore, at the point that the Dalek pursuit ship was remote controlled to return to Varga and the story looped back to its original location for the grand finale, an idea was developed that would allow the plot to be reset for a similar set of events to play out again. When the Doctor reveals the location of the Time Destructor that he had stolen and hidden, he would surreptitiously remove its vital core. The Daleks would unwittingly take possession of an impotent version of their weapon, and the Doctor and his friends would make good their escape once again. These events would stretch to fill the first six episodes, providing a conclusion to the first half, but omitting the final punch-up with the Daleks. But this second time our heroes flee, there is one critical difference. This time, they are not in an ordinary spaceship. With many episodes still to fill before the final showdown, the story needed to take a new turn to stay fresh. To sustain interest, the writing team added a new dimension. A fourth dimension. From this point, in many ways, a different adventure begins, and unlike the gritty espionage episodes, this new saga is very much in the mould of the chase, once again being a whimsical journey through time filled with comedic moments and larger-than-life characters. The distinctive Bond-style spy thriller vibe that Nation had been fostering since his space security storyline had begun in Mission to the Unknown would become a distant memory. But the rehashed chase through time would not have to begin immediately, 
because, as luck would have it, Episode 7 fell on Christmas Day, allowing for the creation of an entirely standalone episode with no plot nor continuity needed whatsoever. It did not feature any of the antagonists, such as Mavic Chen or the Daleks, but instead went all out on the comedy. The episode, entitled The Feast of Stephen, was Doctor Who's first Christmas special, which we detailed in its own video, link in the description and at the end of this video. The original outline for the first version of the 12-parter had the Christmas Day episode set only in the world of Zed Cars, and it was the following New Year's Day episode 8 which included the visit to Hollywood. This episode would also have seen the Daleks first set out in their time machine, resulting in the aliens crashing through the movie studio set. The plan for the rest of episode 8 was for the Daleks to invade the cricket test match and also confront the Doctor's party on the edge of a volcano, where one Dalek falls in. The episode would have ended with a rendition of Old Lang Syne. Episode 9 was to be set in ancient Egypt, in which the Daleks are largely wiped out, but one wily unit manages to recover the core and escape back to their base. Now in episode 10, the tables are turned, and the Doctor is the one in pursuit, hoping to navigate to the Dalek planet and stop their plan. On the way, the TARDIS lands at an atomic testing site alongside the tower which would have held aloft the bomb. It's difficult to say what drama could be extracted from such a scenario, other than the dawning realisation of what they were standing next to, but that was a problem for Dennis Spooner to write. Finally, they would reach the planet Varga, only to discover it deserted. Assuming that the Dalek plan is near to activation, the Doctor realises he faces the impossible task of searching millions of planets to try to find the Daleks to defeat them. In episode 11, the Galactic Counselors are found locked up and they are released so that they can go off and all raise their own armies to fight the Daleks. Rather surprisingly, the Doctor is prepared to call it a day at this point, feeling that the alien delegates can get on with the defence of the galaxy through conventional force. But in a twist, they glimpse a lone Dalek entering a secret shaft to an underground base and realise that the war force is still there and preparing to mobilise. Episode 12 brings us full circle to the final punch-up. And so concludes the original 12-part synopsis. At the start of July 1965, after another round of discussions to hone the story, it was decided that the second phase of Master Plan should introduce its own additional guest star. For three episodes, Dennis Spooner would write in his creation of the meddling monk, played by Peter Butterworth, who had first appeared in The Time Meddler. This inclusion would suit Spooner's more jovial style of writing and further shift the tone away from Nation's grim first half of the story. To delay the introduction of the Daleks' pursuit, Mavic Chen and the Daleks instead spend episode 8 chatting. They are unaware that they have been fooled into accepting a fake version of the Terranium Core, but by a strange coincidence, the conversation between the baddies happens to turn to time travel to inform the viewer of the status quo regarding the technology at Mavic Chen's disposal, just in case it becomes relevant. I hear your experiments in that field are progressing, Trantors. We have not yet succeeded. Only the Daleks know how to break that time barrier. Not long after, the Daleks realise that the core of their weapon has been taken away in the TARDIS, and coincidentally, they do need to make use of the time travel technology that they have available. The Black Dalek gives the command that would see the next stage of the pursuit begin. Report to Scarlo! They must send a time machine to us immediately! I obey! Then, the Dalek time machine arrives on Kemble. Your order has been carried out. The time machine is ready to commence operations. Excellent! So what is the machine called this time? On page 14 of Spooner's draft script for episode 8, he refers to a DARDIS and clarifies the Dalek time machine. It crops up twice more on page 27. When the scripts were typed up for rehearsal by Donald Tosh, the term was carried over, and the final camera script also retains the term, as well as often using Dalek Time Machine, which director Douglas Camfield abbreviates to DTM. 
but again, it's only ever used in the stage directions and doesn't cross over into the dialogue. Towards the end of episode 8, the countdown to its departure is used as a joke to coincide with the countdown to New Year's Eve, thankfully supplanting the rendition of Old Lang Syne, which might have ended up being even more notorious than the famous Christmas Toast to Camera. It's therefore episode 9 that the TARDIS is finally cranked up as the villains follow the TARDIS into Earth's history. It's sometimes said that Master Plan borrows the format of the chase wholesale, but compared to the original storyline, this is far from the case in the final version. In fact, the Daleks only make one return journey in their time machine. The impression of a longer time-hopping pursuit is due to the TARDIS visiting several places in quick succession during episodes 7 and 8, and then the subplot about the meddling monk following them through time too. But it is true to say that episodes 9 and 10 of Master Plan are based on a rejected story element from the chase, the Daleks visiting ancient Egypt. An idea pitched for the chase was that a Dalek would be bricked up by the Egyptians, forming the start of a tomb which would eventually grow to become the Great Pyramid. This idea was not fully adopted in Master Plan, but during the battle scene there is a shot of rocks being hastily piled up to trap a Dalek. This Egyptian setting forms its own little two-part adventure with a new supporting cast spanning both episodes and Peter Butterworth stealing the show once again. Interestingly, he recognises the Daleks on sight. So, you have heard of the Daleks? Oh, yes, yes, uh, by reputation. Then you are certainly not of this time. No. As stated, with the monk arriving as well as the TARDIS, there are eventually three time machines converging on the pyramids but it's the Daleks craft we're interested in. The exterior was a compact capsule, and, learning the lessons of the previous story, was made to look like an enclosed shape, however they still kept the motif of having four doorways. As before, the size was tailored to the shape of a Dalek, meaning that Mavic Chen and other humanoids had to duck awkwardly to get in and out. The main body of the prop was, surprisingly, painted a vivid orange, to resolve the usual problem of how to get a large number of individuals to come in and out of a small space, a doorway at the rear kept the structure open so that people could come through from behind. Spooner notes in his script that the interior appearance of the craft will be, presumably the design as seen in the previous serial, with slight variations. For this set, Technological continuity was maintained from the chase by using exactly the same central hexagonal console as before, and the prop remained in reasonable condition although the spinner inside was removed. There's a twist in the tale of the use of this prop which we'll come back to. Just as in the chase, there were screens around the outside of the room with black and white patterns, but this time the video screens were practical monitors rather than overlaid electronic effects. Although the communication unit into which Vicky speaks in the chase wasn't reused in the Daleks' master plan DARDIS, it was recycled into two different sets throughout the story, first in the main control room and later into the testing area for the time destructor on Kemble, as seen here. The panels at the edge of the room are of interest, as the front strip with their circular controls and white blocks would later be rebuilt into the front of the control desks inside the capsule in Power of the Daleks. The structure of those desks in power also came from Masterplan, as they began life inside Mavic Chen's spa ship, and they were reused inside the Dalek pursuit ship. The judicious recycling of props between the pursuit ship and the DARDIS is all part of the ingenious approach that the Doctor Who production team took to make a tiny budget stretch as far as possible, and this was an especially logical move when reusing the central console from the original DARDIS in its second iteration. However, this hexagonal timeship column has an extra layer to its history. Starting with the precursor episode, Mission to the Unknown, the Dalek control room on Kemble featured a large central prop with a giant dome. As we outlined in a previous video on script mistakes and prop mysteries, this unit was originally built for a TV adaptation of the George Orwell play 1984 and it was then used in a Wayne and Shuster comedy sketch, as seen here, before being brought in to Doctor Who to appear in Mission to the Unknown. 
It was next used in Episode 3 of the Daleks' master plan, by which point it was in a state of some disrepair, but things would get worse. Three days ahead of recording Episode 5, Counterplot, Barry Newbury wrote a memo to say that this important prop, which was stored at Ealing, had somehow been badly damaged, to the extent it could not be used again for the next episode. In despair, he asks how this ever-present worry can be eased. As a result of this crisis, another centerpiece had to be drafted in, and the next best thing was the hexagonal timeship column from the chase, which can therefore be seen in the surviving episode 5 in the Kemble control room, unrelated to the time machine. And this sighting came before its correct use in the Dardis set later. The 1984 prop had to undergo a lot of repair, and when it did finally take its rightful place in Episode 6, it looked quite different. Once the two-part Egyptian mini-adventure was concluded, the Dalek time machine had served its purpose in the story. It landed back on Kemble in Episode 11, The Abandoned Planet, where it remained parked for the conclusion of the story. However, it did have one final role to play, as Stephen and Sarah discuss a plan featuring the timeship, which ultimately goes nowhere but it provided Spooner with another precious 30 seconds of dialogue as he valiantly tried every trick he can to fill the episode's runtime. So is Dardis a canonical term for the Dalek time machine? That depends whether unspoken script directions are a valid enough source. There have been several situations where a name is not spoken, but it is stated in the script. However, usually those names appear in the end credits, which informs the audience and this is the case with the monsters known as the Primords in Inferno. But what about characters or monsters not mentioned in the end credits? There are examples such as the Gel Guards from the Three Doctors, Pigbin Josh from the Claws of Axos, and even the much-loved Sentriel from Mission to the Unknown, none of whom have ever had their names mentioned in dialogue, nor are they in the end credits, yet Doctor Who fans know their names. Which proves that names can become accepted, even if they only existed behind the scenes in production paperwork. So why didn't Dardis catch on once its name seeped into the fan consciousness? The answer is because it's really just a joke by Dennis Spooner in a generally offbeat script. It's a play on the name of the TARDIS, obviously, and there's no logical way that the Daleks would have genuinely named their own craft based on some fun wordplay. And TARDIS is also an acronym, so if we were to assume that the D in Dardis is for Dalek and the rest is the same, then it makes no sense. Therefore, there's no in-universe logic to the naming of the ship, making it easy to dismiss. It also doesn't need a name, since all the characters call it the Dalek Time Machine. And fundamentally, it just sounds a bit silly. Although that is fitting, really, because the second half of Master Plan is quite often a bit silly. Terry Nation had originally devised a very serious six-part space security secret service serial, which aimed to be tonally different from the frivolity of the chase. But in the scramble to double its duration, we get a Christmas parody episode, a comedy cricket match, and a mummified monk. The addition of the Dardis was part of a desperate ploy to add padding, but in doing so, the plot mechanics of the more realistic espionage story were greatly undermined. Once we are reminded that the Daleks have time travel at their disposal, you wonder why there is any angst about it taking decades to replace the lost Terranium when they could just nip into the future and get some more. And what havoc can a time destructor wreak that strategic use of a time machine cannot? But despite all the plot issues that the Dalek time machine creates, in the hands of a skilled director like Douglas Camfield, the diverse nature of this epic saga becomes part of its appeal as the Dardis breaks down the barriers of time to give us a more unusual adventure amongst the pyramids. And with nine episodes still missing, if history has taught Doctor Who fans anything, it's that adventures in Africa can be extremely rewarding. <laughs>